fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In contemporary Australia, the two big issues, of course, have been the treatment of our First Peoples and of our Last Peoples, of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, and of refugees and new arrivals. And so a lot of my writing in Eureka Street has focused on those two questions as we've tried to get right the national policy parameters and as we've tried to get right the church response to those sorts of questions. And of course we're in the best in which I was ordained, made by my mother, Patricia, and designed by Miriam Rose Ullman at Daly River. This vestment has become something from a name of the Australian church. It was worn by the Aboriginal Anglican Bishop Arthur Melbourne to open up the World Council of Churches Assembly. A year after the inception of Eureka Street, we had the High Court's Marbo decision, and that led to a very long heart and soul searching by the nation as to how to accommodate the native title rights of Australian Aborigines. It was the first time in the life of the nation where Aborigines really did have a place at the bargaining table and I had a role as advisor to the Bishops Conference previously in terms of Aboriginal affairs and I had working relationships with a lot of the key Aboriginal groups and so Eureka Street there became I think a good venue for the discussion to occur I remember a wonderful event in the church at Richmond in 1993, sponsored by Eureka Street, where Patrick Dodson and myself spoke. And it was the very night we received the word of the death of Nugget Coombs. And so there was a lot of history in the church that night as we wrestled with issues to do with Aboriginal rights and reconciliation. And it's possible that here is Jesus who proclaims his message. And his message is not they ought to do something different. Rather, the message is addressed to us personally. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come here. If we look at an issue like the federal intervention in relation to Aboriginal Australians, we see that there is by government adherence to what they call the principles of non-discrimination and instituting special measures only with the consent of Aboriginal Australians. But I think when you look at the fine print, you see that there's still something which is patronising in the government's approach. As to whether we've gone backwards, there have definitely been very acute social questions that have arisen in remote Aboriginal communities. I don't think it's as if there hasn't been progress. The big progress in contemporary Australia has been we now have an Aboriginal middle class. We never did when I started this work 30 years ago, and that's been a positive development. Another positive development in terms of reconciliation has been not only something like the apology in Parliament, but that it's gratefully received by Aboriginal Australians and there's a sense that we can now work together without the blame game of the past in working towards trying to close the gap. In terms of refugees, Australia, because we're an island nation continent, we have deep in our psyche this notion that somehow we can secure our borders absolutely and still be decent. In a globalised world, borders are always porous. And if you're going to be a decent civilised society, you can never be so mean and nasty as to repel people who are fleeing some of the meanest and nastiest regimes in the world. We're still to get it right in Australia in terms of striking the appropriate balance where we extend that decency to boat people while at the same time having room for other people coming with humanitarian claims from remote refugee camps. Take this all of you and eat it. This is my body which will be given up. In Australia, I think there's always a presumption in the public square that we continue to improve on our human rights record. I don't know that that's necessarily so. In fact, to make a slightly theological point, it's not as if we're assured that the kingdom is breaking in constantly here and now and that things are getting better and better. No, dealing with fallen human nature as we are, and given the swings and cycles we have of our politics, and particularly at the moment where I think if you look historically you'd agree that no matter which side of the political fence you're on our political leadership is not as visionary and strong and idealistic 
as it's been at some stages in our past. And so, given that, I think there's still real work to do for publications such as Eureka Street and for people like myself in the public square. And for me, it's always been a question as a Jesuit, how do you remain true to the teaching of the hierarchical church and how do you maintain your integrity in the public square where you are engaging in issues of significance? And that's an ongoing tension for me. To take a very contemporary example on issues such as, for example, same-sex marriage. Now, there's a lot of teaching by the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, which members of the public generally construe as being somewhat homophobic. Now, I'm not saying the writers are homophobic, but you can see how people in a contemporary setting in a society like Australia do take offence at notions about the disorder of the homosexual condition and things of that sort. So for me it's always a challenge in trying to move beyond the particular Vatican language to see how we can really be true to the Gospels in terms of working for justice, which always means accommodating the legitimate rights, entitlements and expectations, particularly of unpopular minorities, and also how can we satisfy the conditions of the common good or the public interest. Now, in order to engage in that discussion, it's never good enough in a contemporary society like Australia simply to quote Vatican documents. I was given the epithet meddling priest by Paul Keating after he'd retired as Prime Minister, I should point out. He thought that during the so-called WIC debate that I was a little too close to the action. And if I might say with all respect to Paul, I think he was a little outside the loop. But I've been happy to wear the epithet meddling priest. I don't think that I am a meddling priest, but I think that the epithet applies to someone who's in there, in that grey area between church and state. And one of the things I've always relished is I'm not there representing any constituency. I'm not there delivering a bundle of votes to a particular political party. I'm only as good as my last argument. And I think what's useful in my role is being trying to bridge some of the gaps that exist between the fullness of our rhetoric as church and the particular demands which are on politicians who have to affect compromise. What I've always enjoyed about Eureka Street is it's not the Pravda of the Catholic Church. It's a venue where you know that there are people who are informed by the Catholic tradition but who are genuinely engaged with the pursuits and the concerns of their fellow citizens. It's a place where you can forthrightly express nuanced views about issues to do with faith and justice. Now, of course, there are a few faithful commentators who every time I put pen to paper, they're in there joining issue with me immediately. Sometimes I think it's a little ad hominem, but at least on a venue like Eureka Street, I think things find a level, and I think with the sort of feedback and conversation that's set up, it has been a useful vehicle for us to be able to not only participate in the public square, but to educate ourselves as a church community where we're being true to the Jesuit tradition and we're being able to play our role as church without being too hung up about the hierarchy and authority.